اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین بارئ الخلائق اجمعین والصلاة والسلام على اشرف الانبیاء والمرسلین سیدنا و نبینا و حبیب قلوبنا و طبیب نفوسنا و شفیع ذنوبنا ابی القاسم محمد اللہم صل علیہ وسلم الصلاة والسلام على آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين الميامين المظلومين واللعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من يوم عداوتهم إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه وهو أصدق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا أطيئوا الله وأطيئوا الرسول وأولي الأمر منكم صلاة على محمد وآل محمد صلی علیہ محمد 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 Imamat in Islam. Last night we discussed Imamat from the perspective of Islamic theology or Ilmul Kalam. And tonight we wish to discuss Imamat from the perspective of history or Tariq. Obviously, when we talk of Tariq and history, we will bring it up to the most recent events, and therefore, in some sense, it is a historic as well as a political analysis of the issue and concept of imama. I mentioned last night that there were two particular audiences that I was um, addressing in addition to um, all of you as well. One were those uh, Muslims who are non-Shias but who hold this belief that the concept of imamat is alien or foreign to Islam or to Orthodox Islam and it was introduced by the Shias. And uh, we talked about that yesterday extensively to prove that imamat is believed by all Muslims, even if they differ on what the qualities of an imam must be or how an imam gets elected. The other group that I said I was keen to address as well were those Muslims who have embraced Islam more recently, who usually refer to themselves as revert Muslims but who also say that I am neither a Shia nor a Sunni, I am just a Muslim. And it is these Muslims in particular that I wish to address today. So yesterday the main focus was on those Sunni Muslims who say Imamat is foreign to Islam. We have dealt with that. Tonight we want to address those Muslims who say it suffices to believe in the Quran and Rasul and one can be a Muslim without being of any particular leaning or inclination or following any particular school of thought. And we want to dispel that idea and see why when you become a Muslim or when you say you are a Muslim, you cannot sit on the fence on this issue. You must take a position. I would rather you say you are a Sunni Muslim than say I am neither Shia nor Sunni. And in fact, it is impossible to be something besides that because the moment it is time for Salat and you do Wudu, the way you do Wudu will tell me who you are. So you can say all you like, I'm not Shia, I'm Sunni, I'm not Sunni, but how you pray will tell me who you are. But from an ideological and theological perspective as well, it is important to have an understanding of who we follow uh, in our understanding of the Quran and of course the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Before we begin the subject though, just a correction from last night uh, that was brought to my attention. Um, last night when I was talking about the two main understandings in theology amongst the Sunni Muslims, the Ash'ari and the Mu'tazili, and I gave some examples of scholars from each side, I mentioned that Fakhruddin Razi was a Mu'tazili and it was brought to my attention that he was actually an Ash'ari. And uh, I just want to shed a little light on this. Uh, it is true that most scholars will say that 
Fakhruddin al-Razi was an Ash'ari scholar of uh, a Shafi'i following from a fiqh perspective. However, it is interesting to note as well that he did hold certain views that were Mu'tazili. For example, if you look at the um, Encyclopedia of Islamic Philosophy uh, that was edited by Oliver Lehman and I think Sayyid Hussein Nasser as well, there is an article in there by John Cooper on Fakhruddin Razi. And he talks about how Fakhruddin Razi had certain differing opinions from the Ash'aris on issues like free will, for example. Although that's not our discussion. And the, uh, the, the Wahhabi understanding, uh, they call themselves Salafi. When I say Wahhabi, I don't mean uh, as, as uh, in, in a derogatory manner, but because if I say Salafi, most of you don't understand who I'm referring to, as followers of uh, Muhammad ibn al-Wahhab uh, or Abdul Wahhab. Um, they have actually set up a website called Ash'aris.com. And on their website, they try to prove this idea that there are true Ash'aris and false Ash'aris. And they divide them as early Ash'aris and later Ash'aris. And they say that individuals like Ash'ari himself, the founder, and Al-Baqilani, whom I mentioned yesterday a number of times, they are true Ash'aris and what they call early Ash'aris. And they actually uh, um, have condemned Fakhruddin Razi and Al-Ghazali as later Ash'aris. And the reason they condemn them is they say they held certain views that were Mu'tazili. So if you like, uh, you could say Fakhruddin Razi was a later Ash'ari or an early Mu'tazili in whatever you wanna, way you want to understand it. But that is not our subject. It's just to clarify this because it's on record and I don't want to... Uh, have misled uh, anyone on this. So um, I just wanted to clarify this. If you can recite a salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. In continuing our discussion then, when we talk about the concept of imamat in history, our first discussion is from the books of Sirah and history. Can we find examples where the Messenger of Allah himself, peace be on him and his family, expressed an opinion about his successorship? Not from the books of the Shia. From the books of the Shia, it is very clear that he expressed his opinion and that he made it very clear that Ali salam, was to be his successor. But from the perspective, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. From the perspective of the non-Shias, can we look and find examples? And indeed we can. The first example we get is from Sirah ibn Hisham, a very well-known uh, biography of the Prophet. In that it says that when the Prophet invited Banu Amir, this was a tribe that he invited towards Islam, and these was the days when he was still in Mecca, he hadn't yet been invited to Medina, they offered to embrace Islam on a condition. They said to him, we will accept your message on the condition that if you gain power, will we have any authority and any say in the matter after your passing away? And Ibn Hisham in his sirah says, that even at a time when Muslims were few in number and weak, and you would imagine that the Prophet was looking for as much support as possible, he refused to compromise on this issue. He said to them, Al-amru Allah haythu yasha. This matter is in Allah's hands, he will place it wherever he pleases. And of course, he could have said at that point that this message, this matter is in the hands of the Ummah or this matter is in the hands of the people who will have influence, the Ahlul Halli Wal Aqd that we mentioned yesterday. But he didn't mention any of this. He said, no, I cannot promise you anything like that. This is one example. The other example as well from Sirah ibn Hisham says that after Rasulullah sallallahu moved to Medina and established himself there, he sent a man as an ambassador called Salit bin Amr to Yamama. 
Yamama was a place that was ruled by a Christian uh, um, ruler. And uh, he sent this uh, Salit bin Amir there to invite them to Islam. The ruler there said to Salit, sending a message back to the Prophet, he said, what you invite me to is indeed beautiful. But I am a poet and I am an orator and the Arabs venerate and honor me. Give me some authority and I will follow you. فَجْعَلْ لِي بَعْدَكَ الْأَمْرَ أَطَّبِعُكَ Give me some authority, I will follow you. And again we are told the Prophet refused to compromise on this issue. And in fact he said, even if he asks me for an inch of land, I will not give it to him. This is entirely in God's hands. In other words, I am not the one who is going to choose my successor. Allah will choose who should succeed me. And there is another famous history that records the history of the Prophet that's known as Tariq ibn Kathir. Tariq ibn Kathir says that this ruler of Yamama actually threatened the Prophet and said, if you give me an assurance that I have some power and some successorship after you, I will follow you. But if you deny me this, then I will bring an army and fight you. And the Prophet again said, Allahumma akfinihi. O oh Allah, suffice for me against him. But he refused to compromise in this issue. So we see that even from the books of the known Shias, there were incidents where people explicitly asked the Prophet for authority and position after him, but he refused to compromise on this. We then bring this discussion to another issue and say, did the Sahaba have an opinion on this issue of Khilafat and Imamat, how important it was or it wasn't? And I want to give you a few glimpses on how the Caliphs deemed this to be so important in their own uh, times of rule. There is a very famous book on this issue of Imamat and Khilafat by a scholar, a non-Shia scholar called Ibn Qutayba. Ibn Qutayba's book is called Al-Imamatu was Siyasa. Unfortunately, I don't believe it is in English. Ibn Qutayba says that uh, when the Caliph Umar ibn al-Khattab was dying, he sent his son Abdullah, we talked about Abdullah yesterday, you remember, when he went to Hajjaj to pledge allegiance. He said when Umar was dying, he sent his son Abdullah to the wife of the Prophet Aisha to ask permission that once he has died, he would like to be buried next to the Prophet and Abu Bakr. And because her room was adjacent to the grave of the Prophet, he wanted permission that he should be buried within that, that area there. And so Ibn Qutayba says that Abdullah bin Umar came to Umm al-Mu'mineen Aisha, asked for permission. She gladly allowed it and said it would be an honor. And then she said to Abdullah to take a message back to his dying father. Now these are the words of Ibn Qutayba, I quote. She says to him, Ya Bunaya, ablig Umara salami wa kullahu. My son, give my greetings to Umar and say to him, La tuda' ummatu Muhammad bila ra'. Do not forsake and abandon the nation and the ummah of Muhammad without a shepherd, without someone to look after them. Istakhlif alayhim. Appoint someone as a successor, as a khalifa over them. فَإِنِّي أَخْشَى عَلَيْهِمُ الْفِتْنَةِ For indeed I fear mischief and trials for them if you do not appoint someone. And so he says that Abdullah ibn Umar came and advised his father and his father then appointed the shura from which then the Caliph Uthman was appointed. So we see then that also from the history of the Muslims this issue of successorship was of concern to all the prominent people, including the wives of the Prophet. Similar to this, Ibn Qutayba in his book, as siyasatu wal Imama, al Imamatu wa Siyasa, says that after Muawiyah took leadership and Khilafat from Imam Hassan, salam, he came to Medina to promote and push for his son Yazid to be his successor. And in Medina again, Interestingly enough, he met Abdullah bin Umar. And his words to Abdullah bin Umar, according to Ibn Qutayba again, is, I dislike the idea of leaving the Ummah of Muhammad after me like sheep without a shepherd. That this nation must have a shepherd, and that is why I am pushing for Yazid to be there. 
And so the understanding then that the Muslims have from all this is that the caliphs were very, very concerned about the ummah. And they had so much love and so much compassion for the ummah that they would not tolerate the idea that this ummah should be scattered like sheep without a shepherd. Yet the Prophet was not concerned. See, this is the issue that we have. If you look at the incident of how the Caliph Umar was appointed, again from sources that are not Shia, we are told that when Abu Bakr was dying, he called Uthman to write his will, who then became the third Caliph. And we are told that Uthman was sitting by his bedside, and Abu Bakr said to Uthman, write in my will, I, Abu Bakr, the son of Abu Quhafa, appoint after me, and then he fainted. When he gained consciousness, he said to Uthman, let us continue writing the will. Uthman said, there is no need, I have finished it. He said, what did you write? He said, I wrote, I, Abu Bakr, the son of Abu Quhafa, appoint after me Umar ibn al-Khattab. To which Abu Bakr said, thank God for your foresight. These are not the exact words, this is my paraphrasing. But he said, thank God for your foresight, because had you not done this, the Ummah would have been left without a guide. Or he may have said, thank God. God for appointing just the person I wanted to appoint. But the idea is that all the people of prominence could not accept this fact that the ummah should be without a guide, building upon what we discussed yesterday. So we come back to this issue again, that how is it possible that every caliph had this concern, that the ummah are like sheep, they need a shepherd and a guide. But the Prophet, Allah and his messenger, are absolutely quiet. They have no statement on this issue at all, what happens to the Ummah. And this is something that is really uh, a matter that we need to get a response. We, we're just asking for an answer. We're not looking to convince or convert anyone. We're saying, tell us, how is this possible? What could be the reason that the Prophet would be absolutely quiet? Not even a weak hadith to say, I, am, I have been asked not to appoint someone. Just silence. One argument that may come is that the messenger of Allah was a messenger. He wasn't a ruler. He wasn't a temporal ruler like the others. And therefore, it was not for him to appoint someone. He just brought a message. If that is the case, then we must look at history and say, did Rasulullah simply sit at home and deliver messages? Or did he take an active role in organizing society? Did he play a very active role in what you might call interfere in how the society's culture, social, political, economic uh, uh, structure would be formed? Did he actually take part in all the battles, in all the decision making? Did he bring about a certain constitution by which an Islamic state was established in Medina? Which is the case. If the argument is he was not a ruler, then he should have just stayed at home and maybe come out once a day or every Friday morning and say, Oh people, I'm a messenger. Allah has revealed to me this ayat. This is the ayat. Don't shoot the messenger. I'm going home. Every day come, deliver the message, go away. But this is not the case. He takes a very, very involved role in every single decision making. So it cannot be possible that he is simply someone who is delivering the message. We also ask this question that the demise of the Prophet was not sudden and unexpected. It wasn't like the case of the Caliph Uthman, where people just stormed into his palace and just stabbed him and killed him, and there was no opportunity to make a statement. We know well ahead that when he went for the final pilgrimage, and he asked people to join him because it was his final pilgrimage, Shia and Sunni, even those who don't mention, if you go to the websites that talk about the khutbah, the sermon in Ghadir Khum, even though Ghadir Khum cannot be denied, there is so much research on that, the only thing that can be denied is the meaning of the word mawla, that when the Prophet said, man kuntu mawlahu, okay, and that is clutching at straws, because as a poet put it very well, in vain you argue the meaning of mawla, Ali is mawla in the same sense that the Prophet is mawla. If the Prophet is a friend to you, then Ali is a friend to you. 
It's in the same sense, Man kuntu mawlahu fahada ali mawla. But no one can deny the event that took place. But even the websites that give the whole sermon and the books that narrate the whole sermon, even when they don't mention at all the issue of Ali and Man kuntu mawla, they say the Prophet said other things as well. They do mention this fact that he said to the people, I have been summoned by my Lord and I will respond to that. And it is possible that I will not be with you much longer. This is very, very clear. Everyone has accepted this and quoted this. You pick any place this khutbah, you will see these words. So that means the Muslims knew he is leaving. This is like two months before his passing away. And then when he falls sick, there is a whole, when he's ill, there is a whole week where people are expecting him to pass away any time. Right? When he's gaining conscious, he's unconscious, he has a bandage around his head, someone else is leading prayers in his place. So it is not a shock or a surprise. How is it possible that no one, not one Sahaba came and asked the Prophet that if God forbid something should happen to you, who do we follow after you? Absolute silence. This just really defies all uh, um, logic and it just doesn't make any sense. And then you add to that this issue that I, hint, I, I said last, last night as well, that when he says, give me something to write so that you don't go astray after me, he is opposed, he is accused of not speaking sense, and there is a commotion, and there is an argument that the book of God is enough for us. It is very clear that something, there was some attempt to stop from, any, from, from a declaration being made. Right? I mean, even if you are naive, you surely must smell something here. Because if you don't, I can smell something. Right? It is not possible that there would be just deafening, deafening uh, silence. So these are the arguments we bring to this whole discussion to say that the opinion of the Prophet from the Sirah ibn Hisham, Tariq ibn Kathir, and from the behavior of the Sahaba, and from historic events is very, very clear that it is not possible that this was a matter that Allah and His Messenger would have just ignored and not have absolutely anything to say about if you can recite Salawat Allah Muhammad wa Ali. Muhammad. Now I want to take this discussion to another level, and this is where I, in particular, want to address uh, my um, revert Muslim brothers and sisters who say, I'm a Muslim, I'm neither this nor that. The question that is asked, maybe the first question that will come to the mind of a revert Muslim when they, when they come to Islam and they're thinking what is right, what is wrong, the first question that will come to mind is how could the majority be wrong? How could so many be wrong? If the Shias are right, why are they so few in number? Okay. And I want to take a glimpse at how you study history. See, history, even though it strives to be unbiased, it is always biased. And history, for the most part, is written by those who are in power and in authority. And it is their word that always counts as the gospel truth. Even the official history of Canada is written by the government of Canada. And it is preserved in the library of the parliament. You can stand up and start writing the history of Canada if you like. But that's the unofficial history of Canada. It doesn't have any value. The one that's the history of Canada will come from the government. They will write the history of the country. Right? And so even when a scholar writes history, you have to watch who is this scholar coming from? What is his perspective? Who is funding that project? Even when a person sits at home and writes, he has to earn a living. Somebody is going to pay him to write that history. To give you a glimpse of how history can be biased even in this day and age, I've brought a book with me here that I want to show you. Just, uh, you know, uh, uh, the reason I bring the book is I know some of you may have been frightened when you saw me bring this book in, thinking, oh my God, tonight is <laughs> going to be a long night. I only want to bring it here because a lot of times I say things from the pulpit, but you might be going, hmm, I wonder if he really, you know, is speaking from firsthand experience or he heard it from someone else. Okay? This is a book that is called The New Encyclopedia of Islam. It is a revision of a classic work called the Concise Encyclopedia of Islam. And it says the author is Cyril uh, Glasseyer, or 
glass and it's glacé, I think, and it has an introduction by Professor uh, Houston uh, Smith. Okay, it's an academic work from a university, and the author is praised because it's a one man's work. Usually, an encyclopedia would be written by a whole team of people, and it has many entries uh, um, in it. I can't remember now if it's 1,200 or 12,000, but um, when you read it at first, it's very impressive, but it has very, very strong biases against the Shia. When you read the entry on Imam Hassan, when you read the entry on Imam al-Mahdi, when you read the entries on the Shias, you can see very, very clear biases in this, and you're welcome to take a look at it after uh, the program. But what really caught my eye is the subtle manner in which a person expresses his bias without making it obvious, but you will see it if you look at it carefully, right? What the author does is, and this book is, is just so you know how much there is a need for the Shias to get into the academic field and start contributing and expressing the opinion of the Ahlul Bayt and not just expressing it within the mosques and the, uh, the, the, the Husseiniyas, but we really need to go out into the universities and make a statement and show people the other side of Islam because people are speaking on our behalf, right? Um, most encyclopedias may not be in English, the ones on Islam. The ones that are on, in English are very expensive and not affordable by an individual. This is the only encyclopedia on Islam that is in English and affordable to an individual, right? And even then, it is about $50, $60. Now, at the back, there is an appendix where this author has put a chart to show how the different sects of Islam are divided, branches of Islam. Okay? Now look at the bias. The bias is this. Right at the top it says, Revelation of Islam and Prophetic Mission, 610 to 632 AD. Okay? From the name of the Prophet, there is a big thick line that goes down like this, directly under the Prophet. And it says, Sunnis approximately 90% of Muslims. With a little asterisk there, few bullets to say the four schools of law, Hanafi, Hanbali, Maliki, Shafi, and then a little note to say extinct schools, in brackets, Zahiris, etc. That's all. So a nice big thick line, 90% of Muslims are Sunnis, and they just divide it into four sects that are not really a big deal, and the rest are all extinct, right? Just like that. Then the Shias, Big diversion, totally away. You move away from orthodoxy and into heterodoxy. And then you have multiple lines. This looks like an artery, this looks like veins, right? All like cut into little pieces. And every sect, even the ones you've never heard of, are listed there. Old Sheikhis, New Sheikhis, Alawis, Ali Ilahis, Nizari Ismailis, Sulaimanis, Dawudis, Twelver Shias, Fatimid Ismailis. Nusairis, Seveners, Qaysaniya, this and that, and then you know, there's all these little breaks, and it keeps splintering, splintering, splintering. Now, if you are a revert Muslim and you look at this, what is the impression you get? Why are the extinct groups who claim to be Shias all being listed with a branch of their own? And why is this division so much away under the name of Rasulullah? The bias and the obvious implication is that the Sunnis are orthodoxy, and you are a heretic group. You broke away. So that word, Rafidi, those who broke away, is being graphically shown to you how you break away from Islam, from Rasulullah, into these splinter groups. That's why I call this the biased encyclopedia of Islam. You see, if the author had called it the Salafi encyclopedia of Islam, or the Sunni encyclopedia of Islam, I wouldn't have a problem with it. But to call it the Encyclopedia of Islam. This needs to be revised and called with changes, and then it can be called the unbiased Encyclopedia of Islam. And I began wondering what would drive a scholar who has graduated from Columbia University to be so biased. But then his profile reveals that. He says it's a practicing Muslim, and he has done some work in Saudi Arabia for the Hajj Research Center, King Abdul Aziz University in Jeddah. That tells me everything. Okay. So history has biases. And people now, 
your children will go to university and study Islamic history, they will use this as a reference for their research. You see? And the bias is very, very subtle. So this idea that the majority is wrong, is right, is not really the right way for somebody who is truly courageous enough to say, I want to know the truth. Okay? The question that we want to present then to this revert Muslim or to any sincere Muslim who wants to understand whether Islam is part, whether the madhab of the Ahlul Bayt is orthodoxy or it is heterodoxy, if it's really a heretic group that broke away. I want you to ask yourself only one question. And the question is this. Did the majority follow the path they followed because of religion or because of the government? Because the government was always, and I don't mean this in the wrong way, was always Sunni. We know that the rulers of the Umayyads and the Abbasids, some of them were cruel tyrants, oppressors. But let's face it that on, from a fiqh perspective, it was a Sunni government. I'm not trying to imply that the Sunnis promote injustice, but this is how it was in history. And if you read history, no one will deny the fact that the Shias were always marginalized, were always oppressed. The Imams were always kept under house arrest. They were taken away from Medina. They were poisoned. The Shias were killed in large numbers. History records that some of the houses in Baghdad, the Shia Sadat were buried alive into the walls. Instead of cement, the blood of the progeny of the Prophet was used. You may try to suppress this, but the blood of one who is oppressed will not keep quiet. It will gush again and again and speak for the truth. So it's, it's a non-established fact that the Shias were always oppressed. Right? So now let's just look at this from our experience as human beings in the world we live in today. Okay? We are neighbors with the United States. Look at the life of most individuals living in the United States post 9-11. They may know that the administration is unjust, that they are wrong in what they're doing in Afghanistan or wherever, but will the majority speak against the government or they won't? They will not. And they will not for two reasons. There will be one group that will not out of fear. Because the administration has said to them, you are either with us or against us. Right? This is what Bush said. So now you are in fear. Right? How many of us have not committed anything wrong against the United States, but we will not even cross the border? Because when you go there, they'll fingerprint you, they'll, you know, if they could, they put you on a photocopier and photocopy you as well. They'll take pictures, they'll keep you for hours before you can get across the border. Right? Therefore, people out of fear will keep away because they don't want to be called in for interrogation and for questioning and this and that. Right? Ask the scholars who go to preach how many times they are harassed. You just had a scholar who came here for Arba'in. Ask him here in Canada. He was at the airport for four hours. Right? So people will avoid opposing or doing anything that brings them in the eyes of the government. The other group that might speak out, what the government will typically do is they will try to portray them as if they are a heretical group, as if they are out of their mind. And they will try to present their ideas as conspiracy theories. Anybody who said 9-11 was not done by Muslims, it was, it was pushed as a conspiracy theory, isn't it? This is conspiracy theory. So you are bunched along with those people who believe in UFOs, basically. That's the idea, right? Now this is very, very important from a history perspective because from a historic perspective, the moment you label someone, you turn the whole nation and a large number of people and they keep away from this person. This is what the Quraysh used against the Prophet, isn't it? They called him a madman, they called him a poet, and they called him a magician, Sahirun and Majnoon. What was the reason for calling him this? The idea for calling him was not just to get the pleasure of abusing someone, like you might just abuse somebody on the road. The idea was to create fear in people's hearts so that they don't listen to what he is saying. Because people will listen to a label. You will be surprised. Right? 
Many of you, for example, who are immigrants, who have come from uh, India, Pakistan, Iran, or East Africa, you come from a background where the belief in devils and jinn and all is very strong. And it's very subtle in your psyche, even though you don't realize that, right? Now, let us suppose you really like me and you, know, you love me and you respect me and all that, right? Suppose, right? Now, somebody comes to you and tells you, this, this brother Khalil, I've got to tell you something about him. You know, he's got a jinn who really sometimes, you know, when he's alone, he says some of the darnest things. I would advise never be alone with him. He's, you know, like I've really seen some surprising things about And then he just goes away. Now he's planted a seed in your mind. I guarantee you, if I call you the next day and say, come home for tea, you will not come alone. <laughs> True? True. Right? Because that fear has been put in your mind. Now the moment you take a group of Muslims and you say, Rafidi, what does Rafidi mean? Those who broke away, the rejectors, the heretics. Right? Look at the United States. When, listen to the media, because the media is controlled by somebody. He who pays the piper plays the tune, right? When there is a small group fighting the government, and the, and, 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 and the Western and powers and their allies want to, f to favor that small group, they will call them freedom fighters, they will call them activists, they will call them the resistance movement, right? When they're against them, Right? When that small group is fighting and they're opposed to them, then they'll call them insurgents, then they'll call them rebels. Right? This is subliminal brainwashing into your minds. By Allah, I tell you, when I say Wahhabi, I say Wahhabi as followers of Ibn Abdul Wahhab. I don't say it in a manner of derogatory. And if people would understand what I mean when I say Salafi, I would say Salafi. Because my policy is this. That if you really are sincere and you want to reach out to people, don't start with a bias. Present things fairly and let people judge for themselves. But that's not a derogatory term. You're simply saying followers of someone. But to call somebody Rafidi, especially in this day and age. You see, some of the early scholars did refer to some Shia groups as Rafidi. But, and again, in, 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 in being truly sincere, we have to accept and admit that within the Shias, there have been groups who have held extreme views that were wrong. We cannot deny that. Right? These wrong views are called ghulu. And the Imams have spoken about them as ghullats, people who, for example, would believe that an Imam is an incarnation of God and would worship, right? They worship not only Imam Ali, they worship Imam Jafar as Sadiq as well. Right? So these sort of groups existed. And there were early scholars who condemned them and referred to them as Rafidis. But in this day and age, to refer to the Twelver Shias, the Shia Ithnashri, as Rafidi is simply political positioning. It is simply to turn people away so that you don't listen to them. It's like this chart. It's showing you they are a branch. They broke away. They are not with the majority. Okay? So this is something that we have an issue with. Now, you can imagine that if in a state or country that claims to be a democracy and have freedom of speech, like the United States, people will not speak out against the government, either out of fear of just being treated as a heretic or out of fear of being questioned. Can you imagine people speaking out in the Middle East today or in the past? Right? In this day and age, 2010, you, if you lived in the Middle East, those of you who live there, you know how tyrannical some of those governments can be you will not dare speak out against the government because you will disappear so fast into a dungeon and you will be tortured, right? Nobody in Syria, in Bahrain, in Egypt, in Saudi Arabia will dare open their mouths against the government. This is now. Can you imagine 1400 years ago anybody speaking out against the Banu Umayyah or Banu Abbas, right? So you had to, in the days of Hajjaj, this is recorded in books, People preferred to be called an infidel and to become kafir than to be a Shia. It was so dangerous to be a Shia in those days. The moment, if somebody wanted to put you in trouble, even if you were not a Shia, they just accused you of being a Shia and you would disappear in the days of Hajjaj. Okay? So when you say, how could the majority be wrong, 
you must ask yourself this question. Did the majority become majority for political reasons, because the government was majority, or because of aqeedah, because of Islam, because of the theological understanding of imama, because of the understanding of sharia, because the, the fiqh and the teachings of Abu Hanifa was greater than the teachings of Imam Jafar al-Sadiq for example. Was that the reason why the majority followed this? Or was there political reasons for that? And even this argument that there are only four madhabs in Islam, again, I invite all of you to research this. You will see, study the history of the formation of these different sects from a fiqh perspective, these madhahib, the four madhabs. You will see for yourself that when they first began forming, there were not four. They were growing in numbers. There was six, seven, eight, ten, twelve, Hassan al-Basri and others. Each one of them had their own school of fiqh. And they were just growing in number. The government was afraid that if this is allowed, every Muslim will follow his own imam and have his own fiqh. So they put a stop to this and said, as of now, we officially recognize only these four schools. You have to be a Shafi, a Maliki, a Hanafi, or a Hanbali. Anyone else is a heretic. We don't recognize any other madhab. So the government institutionalized these four fiqhs. I believe even the Imams, these four Imams, Shafi, Hanbali, Maliki, Hanafi, who may be the founders of these, they themselves did not foresee this formation. But there is no proof from Quran or Hadith to say that there are only four schools of fiqh in Islam. So where do you get this argument that if you pray Salatul Jamaat before a Shia Imam, your Salat is batil? Your Salat is only valid if you pray behind an Imam who is a Shafi, Maliki, Hanafi, Hanbali. Yet the Imam doesn't have to be Adil. He just has to be following one of these four schools. These schools formed after the time of Imam Jafar al-Sadiq That means the Sahaba, the Tabi'een, the Taba Tabi'een. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. It means all those Muslims from the time of the Prophet's demise until the time that these four schools were formed, all their Salat is batil. Because whose madhab were they following? Okay. So you have to really study history in its context and understand how things came to be the way they came to be. I'm not asking anyone to convert and become a Shia. I'm not asking to brainwash anyone. I'm saying just be fair and accept. We don't even grow in strength if you accept us as a fifth madhab, to be honest. When we ask to be recognized as a fifth madhab, and the Grand Mufti, the Sheikh of Al-Azhar, did do that before Saudi Arabia became the voice of the Sunni Muslims, when the relations between the Shias and Sunnis were very, very warm and cordial. And we would get together on occasions, we would celebrate Miladun Nabi together. I myself remember the days in East Africa, in people who are from East Africa, from places like Mombasa and so on, you will remember that our Sunni brothers would hug us and talk of Sayyidina Ali, Sayyidina Hassan, Sayyidina Hussein. We would, there was no this issue of celebrating the birth of the Prophet as bid'ah. This rift came about after the oil started flowing and Saudi Arabia became a kingdom. Right? So I'm asking you to only understand the issue. And if you embrace and accept the Ahlul Bayt school of thought as a madhab, it is for the good of the ummah. But to be blunt, it, we don't really care. It's not going to make us stronger. We don't look for validation. We've always been on our own. Another 1400 years will not make a difference to us. Right? So this is something that we really need to think about and understand. Somebody once argued and said, the Shias are not a madhab. Why? Because Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Shafi and Imam Malik and Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, they wrote a book on their fiqh. But Imam Jafar Sadiq did not write a book. Therefore, it can't be a madhab. So the understanding of the madhab is right from the beginning wrong. To us, it is not because what they wrote is their risala, their fatawa, the kind of things that Ayatollah Sistani writes. Imam Jafar Sadiq is not a mujtahid. He is a successor to the knowledge of the Prophet. His hadith becomes the source through which someone else writes a book on fiqh. This is our understanding. He is the teacher of Abu Hanifa. Abu Hanifa himself, whose name was Nu'man, if it was not for the two years I studied with Jafar al-Sadiq, I would have perished. So this lahalaka goes way all the way up to Imam Ali. It has a history. So 
this idea of majority history bias really needs to be understood. There is another point that is mentioned about the Shias that I would like to also bring to your attention. A lot of the individuals who oppose the Shias and their teachings and beliefs, they blame the Safavi dynasty. The Safavids had ruled Iran for a long time and it is believed that when they came to power the days of Shah Abbas, that is how the whole of Iran became Shia. And in particular, Saudi Arabia likes to convince the Muslims that there are a really minimal number of Shias in the world. All the Shias are Iran. And they want people to be convinced that Shia equals Iranian. So only Iranians are Shia. In other words, it's a cultural religion for the Iranians. That's the idea that they try to propagate. And then they add to that, that because the Safavids ruled Iran, it is the influence of the Safavids that made the Shias the way they are. I'm not disputing the fact that when a particular group of people rule a country for a period of time, they will bring in ideas and culture into that society that will be different from Islam. We know that. You go to Mashhad today, in the Haram of Imam Rada alayhi salam, you will see up on one of the minarets, they have a certain tradition, they call Nakkare Khane. You must have seen where they beat drums before sunset. As when the sun is setting, they stand and they beat drums. This was from the days of Shah Abbas. We, it's not that we don't know that this doesn't come from Islam. This is a cultural tradition. And culture is not bad if it doesn't oppose Islam. But we understand the difference. The question I have is this, that if one dynasty rules one country, you are willing to believe that they changed the thinking and the ideology of the entire nation. Why are you not willing to believe that the whole duration that the Umayyads ruled, they did not affect the teachings and ideas of those Muslims? and they ruled over the whole Middle East, or that the Abbasids, or that the Ottoman Empire, or that the Seljuks and the Buyids and all those different dynasties, the Shia dynasties are very few. There is the Fatimid dynasty that ruled in Egypt, from which you have the Ismailis, for example, right? That was only Egypt. But for the most part of the Muslim lands, there were groups that ruled that were predominantly following a Sunni madhab. What was their influence on those people? has to be studied scholarly and historically and analyzed. As for example, the ahadith I quoted yesterday that were forged in the name of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Muhammad. That he said that if you are ruled by oppressors who usurp your property, keep quiet, listen and obey, Doing ita'a of the kings of Banu Umayyah is wajib, even if they oppress you, even if they are unjust to you. These sort of hadith, you must at least be open to the idea that they were introduced by those empires and dynasties who ruled over the Muslims to influence them and to preserve their power. You cannot ignore this. If you are really a sincere seeker of the truth. There are two issues I want to discuss still and then come to a conclusion. One is historically how do we prove the right of Amir al and the other is what is the way forward now? This issue of Imamat and Khilafat for Muslims, what next? Okay, So that we really tie all loose ends to this subject. And as far as the right of Amir al goes, I want to be very quick because of the interest of time and as well because I know most of you are aware of this. I just have to mention things as hints and you will pick them up inshallah. And then those who don't, they can always research these on the internet. I mentioned earlier in the day today that when Muslims try to guess who the Prophet may have wanted to be his successor, they suggest certain things that we deem as simply clutching at straws. We don't think as them as being strong arguments. As for example, when Muslims say that the Prophet said, if there had been a Prophet after me, it would have been Umar. We say, well, if this was an authentic hadith, how come nobody thought about it, including Umar himself at Saqifah? Right? Or for example, the argument that the last two or three days of the Prophet's lives, it was Abu Bakr who led the prayers, therefore he is rightfully hinted to be the Caliph. And we said that he was supposed to be in the army of Usama. Right? Plus, this was never brought up at Saqifa. Plus, the fact that Osama himself was the leader of the army. So if you go by simply who was in charge in the last days of the Prophet, he should have had a greater right to the Khilafat. 
So these are really not strong arguments. You keep all these arguments on one side, just trying to guess what the Prophet intended. Right? You now look at what is in favor of Amir al-Mu'mineen salam, and you see the overwhelming evidence of this. First and foremost is the whole da'wat dhul ashira. The first time when Allah says to the messenger, وَأَنذِرْ أَشِيرَةَكَ akrabin To his immediate family. There it is very very clear that the Prophet asks, who will support me? He will be uh, my brother, my successor, my vizier. And it was only Imam Ali who stood up. And the books of history, you will remember many years ago when I recited on the uh, month of Ramadan, on, uh, on the nights of the Shahadat of Amir al I discussed the injustices that were done to him in history. And I mentioned sources where they narrate this incident of Da'wad al-Ashira. But instead of saying the Prophet said, you will be my brother and my successor, he says, and the Prophet said, wakada, wakada, etc., etc. You will be my brother, etc., etc., not my successor, my vizier. Why? To hide this fact that he was appointed right from the days of Mecca. Then you see the night of Hijrah, that the Prophet asks Imam Ali to sleep in his place because he has to go forth for Hijrah. You see, we do not deny the contributions of the Sahaba. People say that the Shias curse the Sahaba. By Allah, we don't. We don't curse them in the sense that you think we curse them. We are more readily to, happy to send blessings on the Sahaba who sacrificed selflessly and sincerely for Islam. The difference between us and the rest of the Muslims is, the Muslims say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa sahbihi ajma'een. Oh Allah, send your blessings on Muhammad and the family of Muhammad and his companions, all of them. We say, what is the definition of Sahaba? They say, anyone who saw the Prophet in his lifetime is a Sahaba. Then I mentioned to you this earlier in the afternoon, that where did all the hypocrites go? Anyone who saw the Prophet, even the hypocrites saw the Prophet. You're bundling them all as Sahaba. We say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa sahbihim muntajabeen wa ashabihim muntajabeen. The difference between muntajabeen and ajma'een is muntajabeen are those who are elect, those who are selected. Now we don't say it all the time in our salawat because according to Sunni ahadith, when the Prophet was asked, how do we send blessings on you? He said, say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Or that he added, kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ali Ibrahim. And that is why even the Sunni Muslims, when they say their salat, they don't say wa ashabi ajma'in. They stop, they say wa Muhammad wa ali Muhammad, kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ali Ibrahim. The ironic part is that when they mention the Prophet, they only say, Allahumma salli alayhi wa sallam. They don't mention the al. Even in the hadith where they say, the Prophet said, send blessings on me and my al, they said, the Prophet, peace be on him, said, do not say blessings on me only, say blessings on me and my al. Right? So we are simply following what the Prophet taught. Now, we are not downplaying the importance and the contributions of the Sahaba. But what we are trying to say is this. There is a difference between what the Sahaba contributed and what the Ahlul Bayt contributed. One very, very, very big difference. What is the difference? That difference will tell you that the Ahlul Bayt were chosen by Allah. What is the difference? The difference is this, that the contributions of the Sahaba, if you remove them from the historic context, Islam is not in danger or compromised. But the contributions of the Ahlul Bayt if you remove them from history, then Islam collapses. Understand this. This will tell you that the Ahlul Bayt are selected. Very simple example. The night of Hijrah. You have Imam Ali, you have Abu Bakr. Imam Ali sleeps in place of the Prophet. Abu Bakr goes with the Prophet, is in the cave with him, migrates to Medina. How he came to meet the Prophet, all that is a different story. Let's just take these two examples. Even if you see the contribution of Abu Bakr there as being something noble and praiseworthy, if he hadn't gone with the Prophet, it wouldn't have changed the course of history or Islam. But if Imam Ali would not have slept in that place of the Prophet, Islam would have changed. So his contribution was necessary. If you look at the battle of Khandaq, Khaybar, when we say they won because of Imam Ali, they say, well, Allah gave Muslims victory. Allah gave Muslims victory, but Allah doesn't come down himself to fight. He does it through someone. 
The person he's doing it through, look who is this person, how important he is. In the battle of Khandak, the Muslims set, history says, they set as if there was a bird on their head when Amr ibn Abdul said, who will fight me? Only Ali stood up. Now if Ali would not have stood up at that time, Islam would have perished. That is why the Prophet said, the complete Iman has gone to fight complete Kufr. Why? Because now the whole Iman rested on Ali. If he would have not gone, it would have collapsed. The battle of Khaybar, the others went and came back. They couldn't defeat. Ali went and conquered it. So his contribution shows that he is critical to the history of Islam. Bilal gave great sacrifices. Bilal took a stone on his chest and refused to say that Allah has any partners. He said, Wahid, Wahid, Allah is Ahad, Ahad, Allah is only one. Our salams to Bilal, great Sahaba of Rasulullah. We're not downplaying it. Ammar, right, and Sumayya, the parents, uh, I mean Yasir and Sumayya, the parents of Ammar, the first shuhada of Islam. Their legs were tied on either side with horses and pulled and they were ripped apart. Our salams to them, great Sahaba of the Prophet. But if they had not been tortured or been tortured, it doesn't change Islam. But if Hussein had not given his blood in Karbala, you would not be a Muslim today. So when you talk of the sacrifices of Ahlul Bayt, never forget this difference, whether you are a Shia or a Sunni, that these are individuals chosen by God, descendants of Ibrahim and Ismail through the Prophet from the time of Adam. In Allah astafa Adam wa Nuhan wa ala Ibrahim wa ala Imran ala alamin. There is a lineage and a progeny that Allah has chosen and kept pure for guidance to mankind ila yawmil qiyamah. And this should not be compared with the sacrifices of the other Sahaba. So Ali's contribution are critical to the survival of Islam. You remove him from history, there is no Islam left. Then you see that when the Prophet goes to Medina, he leaves Imam Ali not only in his place to sleep, he leaves him in trust with all the things that were supposed to be returned to the people because they used to call him as Sadiq and al Amin, so they had given him money and things to keep. Ali had to return these possessions and trust to the people in Mecca. Right? Now, supposing he wouldn't have done that. What would history record? History would have recorded that Muhammad fled to Medina and he took away people's property and usurped it. So that shows that again, the Prophet meant, who do you entrust with? Your heir, your successor. And that again tells us who the Prophet sees as his successor. Then the Prophet comes to Medina, he does not enter it until Imam Ali meets him at Quba. From there they enter to Mecca. Then when he comes into Medina, he assigns everybody a brother, the Muhajir and the Ansar. They are paired as brothers. The only one who is not paired is Imam Ali. When he asks the Prophet, the Prophet said, You are my brother. Fit dunya wal akhirah. Doesn't this tell you that this is the man the Prophet wants as his successor? I mean, you're looking for, you know, you're struggling here and there. It's like, you know, the man who talked about Salman. Somebody said that Salman al Faris, your Salman al Muhammadi, did not get his Islam from. Uh, his understanding of Tawheed from Islam. He says, it's like a man holding a pitcher with water, standing next to a flowing river, and you're arguing this water is not from the river. It's from another river from another country. Like, the writing is on the wall. The battles, I have talked about them. These clearly show the successor to the Prophet. The Prophet is told to close all the doors of all the people's houses that were attached to the mosque in Medina وَسَدَّ الْأَبْوَابَ illa بَابَهُ All the doors were shut except the door of Ali. Ali and the Prophet are the only people whose houses have doors that walk into Masjid al-Nabawi. Even the Prophet's uncle, the Sunnis have narrations to say that he complained to the Prophet, I am your uncle and you are shutting my door, but you are not shutting the door of Ali. And the Prophet said, it is not my doing, Allah has commanded me. So again you are seeing these so many, read Dua Nudba, Dua Nudba is all these fadail that shows you the excellencies of Ali. Mubahala, all these companions are available. The Prophet takes only Ali, right? The incident of Kisa, the Tathir, Ayat of Tathir, again you see there is only Ali. Surah at tawbah now the Prophet is trying to show the Muslims, what if I wanted to do things differently? Even then Allah does not allow me. Read history. When Surah at tawbah was revealed, uh, 
the Prophet was told to deliver these verses to the polytheists in Mecca. Somebody must go and read these verses to the Quraysh in Mecca. The Prophet gave these verses to Abu Bakr and said, go to Mecca and read these on my behalf to them. This is history. He went, when he reached halfway, the Prophet sent Imam Ali behind him. He reached halfway, Imam Ali caught up with him and said to him, O Abu Bakr, the Prophet has said, I must take the surah from you and I should be the one to read it to the Quraysh. And he said, if you wish, you can come with me or if you wish, you can go back. History records he was offended. He went back to Medina. These are the words of Abu Bakr to the Prophet in history. Ya Rasulullah, if you didn't want me to do this, why did you humiliate me? Why send me and then pull me back? The answer of the Prophet is, it was not me who pulled you back. Allah revealed to me through Jibreel that, O oh Prophet, either you go and do it yourself or send Ali, but no one else. Now what more proof do you want that who does Allah want as the successor of the Prophet? Tabuk, when the hypocrites were very strong in Medina and the Prophet had to go for an expedition and there was a fear there'll be a coup in Medina, for the first time the Prophet goes to Tabuk, he leaves Imam Ali behind. The hypocrites start saying, the Prophet doesn't like Ali, that's why he left him. Ali goes out to meet the Prophet to make this point. It is at this point that the Prophet utters the hadith that is known as hadith of manzila. What is the hadith of manzila? Ya Ali, anta minni bi manzilati Haruna min Musa. Illa annahu la nabiyya ba'di. Now what proof do you want? The Prophet is saying, O oh Ali, you are to me like Harun was to Musa. Harun was the successor of Musa. Except that there is no prophet after me. So he is saying he is my successor except that he is not a prophet. Shia and Sunni have recorded Hadith al-Manzila. Hadith al safina Mathalu ahla baytika mathali safina tun nu. My ahl al bayt is like the ark of nu. Whoever boards it will be saved. Whoever does not will drown. Shia and Sunni. Authentic Hadith. What proof do you want? See, I don't understand this. Hadith of Thaqalain. I leave behind two weighty things. In itarikum fikum al-thaqalain. Kitab Allahi wa itrati ahl bayti. The Sunni scholars have said that the second version that says I leave the Quran and my Sunnah is a weak and unreliable hadith. The Sunni muhaddithun are saying this. They are saying the authentic hadith is that I leave behind my Quran, I leave behind the Quran and my Ahlul Bayt. Now my question is, how have you followed the Ahlul Bayt? Quran, we understand. You read it, you memorize it, you do tafsir of it. How have you followed the Ahlul Bayt? If it was sufficient to be guided with one, the Prophet should have said, I leave behind the Quran. But he says, he adds, وَلَنْ يَتَفَرَّقَ حَتَّى يَرُدَّ عَلَيْهِ عَلَى الْحَوْضِ They will not separate until they return to me at the Hawd, Kawthar. That means they are inseparable. Right? So how do you follow them? We love the Ahlul Bayt. Loving the Ahlul Bayt is not following them. If Imam Jafar al-Sadiq is telling you, pray like this, do wudu like this. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. He is telling you to do and practice religion like this, and you are doing it differently, then how have you followed the Ahlul Bayt? Then there is Ghadir Khum. Ghadir Khum is a long, long story, obviously. But I just ask some questions that the ayat that all Muslims say was revealed at Ghadir. Ya ayyuhar Rasul, ballig ma unzila ilayk. Reveal, deliver the message we have given you. And if you do not say what we have revealed to you, then it is as if, فَمَا بَلَّغْتَ رِسَالَةَ You have not delivered anything. Now, what did the Prophet say at Ghadir? He said, pray, fast, go for hajj. And he said, مَنْ كُنْتُ مَوْلَاهُ عَلِيُّ الْمَوْلَى Now, my question is this. What was so important that without it, religion would not be complete? That the Prophet would say, الْيَوْمَ أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ This day, have I completed religion for you? وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي And I've completed on you my favors. وَرَضِيتُ لَكُمُ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينَ Now I am pleased with Islam. Not a heretic religion or heterodoxy. Islam, now I am pleased with it as religion for you. What was missing in religion that had to be completed? Was Salat missing? Was Saum missing? Was Hajj and Zakat missing? Was the fact that Ali was not people's friend missing? 
And that had to be done before Allah would say, now religion is complete and I'm pleased with you. What happened at Ghadir that the Muslims had to congratulate Ali and say, Bakhin, Bakhin, laka yabna Abi Talib. Were they congratulating him that now you have become our friend, before that you were not our friend? So these are things that we need to think. And then the Prophet is told, when you deliver this message, do not fear. Wallahu ya'asimuka minan nas. What will Allah protect you from? He'll protect you from people if you tell them that Salat is wajib. He'll protect you if you tell them Zakat is wajib. So this issue of Ghadir, of course. And then go read the 70th surah of Quran, Surah Al-Ma'arij. Sa'ala sa'ilun bi'adhabin waqi. The man who came to the Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, you told us to pray, we prayed. You told us to fast, we fasted. You told us to go for Hajj, we go for Hajj. Now you appoint your son-in-law as your successor. These are his words. Muslims history. Is this from you or from Allah? Now if people had not understood Man Kuntu Mawlahu as successorship, he would not be saying this. And Rasulullah said, by Allah, it is from Allah. He raised his hands and said, oh Allah, he's cursing his own self. He is so angry. If this is really from you, then punish me. Immediately, immediately a stone falls. Like those Ababil that destroyed the Kaaba, they came to, de to destroy the elephants. A stone falls and hits him on the head and kills him instantly. Muslim historians. And this is the tafsir of the first verse of chapter 70. So what is this? And people say, why did the Prophet wait until he was dying to issue a will and say who should be his successor? The issue is that it's very, very clear. Okay? There is no evidence that Imam Ali ever asked anybody a religious question. Therefore his knowledge was complete and total. He was the most knowledgeable person. And uh, there are many, many other fada'il. The Prophet giving his only daughter to this man tells you something. The w daughter who is so precious to him. Right? He gives him only to this man. And history records that others asked for the hand of Fatima. Abu Bakr asked the Prophet to marry Fatima. This is in history. And a very good book I would recommend to you by Shaheed Baqir al-Sadr is called Fadak fi Tariq. And it is in English as well. Fadak in history. Fadak fi Tariq, Fadak in history. Shaheed Baqir al-Sadr does a very academic treatment to the subject of Saqifa and Fadak. And he presents it in a very unbiased manner, but he analyzes it from a human psychology perspective to explain what was the human reaction when the Prophet denied his daughter to individuals. The jealousies, the anger, the hatred of certain wives of the Prophet to Fatima. There was a psychological human expected reaction to all these events that showed itself up at the Prophet's demise. Okay, so there's a lot of such material that you can go and read. Now, I have gone way over time and I still wanted to discuss the issue of Khilafat. Some of the brothers told me today don't look at the clock, but I don't know if this is true for all of you. With your permission I need another 5-10 minutes if you're okay with that. I want to talk about this issue finally now. That what stops Muslims today from number one, having an Imam and a Khalifa and coming under the banner of one Imam. And Muslims today have a very negative image in the world. Okay? There is a game that people play where I say a word and then you finish the word. Right? So for example, um, if I was to say foot, you would say ball. If I would say cat, you would say dog. And when they televise this on the show and ask people, when you tell somebody fundamentalist, he says Muslim. When you say terrorist, he says Islam. This is the image of Muslims today. Let's face it, right? What is it that is stopping Muslims from shedding this image? What is stopping Muslims, in my opinion, this is my understanding and I stand to be corrected, is the lack, the lack of adala, the fact that justice is not a requirement in leadership in Muslims. It is this reason that you see countries that call themselves Islamic, like Pakistan or Saudi Arabia and other places, even when they see injustices committed, they quote those hadith of the Prophet to say that the Prophet said, even if an unjust ruler rules over you, keep quiet. Unless Muslims take the first step and say these traditions are forged and are untrue, they will not be able to move from this. Look at the successes of the Shias 
versus the Sunnis, and it is not to create a rift, but to just show you the importance of Adala. Right? I showed you in this book it says 90% are Shias. There are other places in the book it says 97% are, sorry, 90% are Sunnis. It says 97% are Sunnis. 3% are the rest. From which a part are the Shia Ithnashari. Okay? Now you go with those numbers and then look at the successes of the 3% over the 97%. We don't believe we are 3%. We are much more than that. But I'm not here to argue on that basis. Take for example the issue of Hezbollah and Hamas today. Look at the successes between the two. How many years Palestine has been fighting? Right? Look at the successes. What is the difference between the two? The difference is that Hezbollah is patterned after Karbala. Karbala's message is this, never oppress somebody who is innocent. But when someone oppresses you, never keep quiet. And this is the principle on which Hezbollah is founded. And that's why you can see the success. 1967, Egypt, Syria, Jordan, three countries got together and attacked Israel from all sides. In six days they were all defeated. With a country the size of, you know, like Chutney we say, like small. But they were all defeated. 2004, right? Hezbollah, just a few bunch of guerrilla we have read in the news ourselves that bombs were being flown from the United States to Israel to fight the Hezbollah. Look at their success. They chased them away and took their land back. Because of which today many Muslims in places like Syria are converting to the madhab of Shia and Ahlul Bayt. Why? Because they are saying that those that we looked up as leaders to us like Saudi Arabia and Egypt and Pakistan, they have kept quiet and sided with these Western allies were oppressing Muslims but these people and because of Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah they are standing up now and acknowledging that leadership must have Adala. There is a famous scholar John Esposito many of you know of him right uh, the Royal Islamic Strategy Studies Center has issued a book called the 500 most influential Muslims you might have seen this it's a 2009 publication and they're promising to publish it every year 500 most influential Muslims in the world now, keeping in mind that we are told the Shia Ithnashari are just three per less than 3%, right? When he lists the 500 most influential people, look at the top 10. Number one, King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia. Number two, Ayatollah Sayyid Ali Khamenei. Number three, King of Morocco. Number four, King of Jordan. Number five, Prime Minister of Turkey. Number six, Sultan of Oman. Number seven, Ayatollah Sayyid Ali Sistani. Then number 8, the Grand Sheikh of Al-Azhar. Number 10 is Mufti of Egypt. Number 11 is the Mufti of Saudi Arabia. Now, do you see something here? From the th less than 3%, there are two individuals. From the 97%, the top 8, 9 are all kings and prime ministers. There is no spiritual leader. The spiritual leaders are who? Sayyid Ali Khamenei, Ayatollah Sistani. This is not us writing this. Doesn't this tell you something? That there is something happening here. How could so few produce the most influential spiritual leaders? And this book is free on the internet. Just search John Esposito or uh, Royal Islamic Strategy Studies Center, 500 most influential. On the cover of the book, they've got three prominent Shias, Ayatollah Sistani, Ayatollah Khamenei, and Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah. Right? So, on this principle as well, the United States attacked Afghanistan, they invaded Iraq when it was ruled by Saddam. They would not dare do it now, even though they say the country is at war. They are constantly talking about Iran, Iran, Iran. We want to bomb Iran. Iran must not have nuclear weapons. But no one dares to take the first step. Why? Because they are Shia. The Shias think on a different way altogether. They do not oppress, but they do not keep quiet to oppression. And the Shia is not an army of one country. You see, the Sunni Muslims, if the Mufti of Egypt says something, the Sunni Muslim sitting in Saudi Arabia doesn't really care, or the one sitting in Canada doesn't care, right? But the Shias pay attention to what their leaders say. If my Mujtahid today says, Jihad is wajib, come, and he will only do it for a just cause, right? I will leave my job, I will leave my family, I will leave everything. On the next flight I'm out, and I'm sure all of you. So it is a global reserve army that stands for this principle, right? Our way of thinking is completely different. 
A couple of years back when the Masumin youth had organized a program called Passion of the Savior, you will remember I talked about this as well, uh, that there are two issues that give the Shias this strength. You see, from the Sunni world perspective, the voice used to be Egypt, and now the voice is Saudi Arabia. From the Shia perspective, it is Qum and Najaf. There are two things, and I just want to mention these and then come to an end, inshallah. Uh, there are two things that make the Shia so prominent and so powerful over others. One is the institution of Marja'iyah, which unfortunately some amongst us are criticizing on petty things. Oh, this wakil is eating khums money, and let me tell you, when Imam Ali was the caliph, he had a governor who took money and ran away with it. Now, will you say that the government of Imam Ali was unjust? Okay. So this is not the way to think. The marjas on their own have no credibility and power, but their power comes from the fact that we say they are naib of Imam. In other words, marja'iyat is tied to the concept of imama, and imama is tied to the concept of adala. And it is from this that we gain our strength. This is what makes us so powerful. We must never let this be compromised. This is one thing. The other thing we have is Karbala with us. And this is what I had mentioned at that conference, at that program, Passion of the Savior. That from the time your child is this young, they come to the mosque, Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein. This child will never oppress someone. This child will never strap a bomb to himself and go and commit suicide. Right? Because we are the followers of those who have always been oppressed. You tell me your child comes to the mosque and hears that in the battle of Siffin, when Muawiyah had the furat, he didn't give water to Imam Ali, but when Imam Ali got it, he opened it and said, take water. Or your child comes and hears every Muharram that Imam Hussein gave water to Hur, even though they didn't give water to him, to Hur's army. How will this child ever think of killing innocent civilians? So, defending justice and the oppressed is grained, ingrained into our nature. Supporting that madloom is very, very much within us. My proposal to the Muslim Ummah, as a conclusion, my proposal to the Muslim Ummah is this. The first step towards shedding this image of being fundamentalist or terrorist, or being identified with Al-Qaeda and Taliban, is to speak of justice in leadership. And leadership starts with Salatul Jama'ah. That is where you have an Imam for a short period. When our Muslim brothers can stand up and say, one of the requirements for the person leading the prayer of Jama'at must be Adala. He must be just in the eyes of society. This will then bring other issues to say that if someone is an Imam for five minutes, he must be just. What about someone who is an Imam perpetually over people? And unless Muslims do not say that those hadith that say the Prophet said follow an unjust Imam are forged, and unless they don't accept that adala, 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 justice must be a quality in an imam, nothing will change in the Muslim ummah. This is a very, very important prerequisite to uh, leadership. If you can recite a salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Tonight we have gathered to remember Imam al-Rida alayhi salam. This imam has great, great contributions to Islam. His role is very, very significant. Unfortunately, time will not permit me to discuss that. But it was important that we discuss this concept of imama. In fact, for people who say that the Shias developed the idea of imamat after the ghaybah, there is a beautiful hadith from Imam Rida that when Ma'moon was forcing him to become the Khalifa after him, or to take the Khilafat from him, so that he could then say, that we are the ones who gave Khilafat to the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt. Look at the reply of Imam Rida to Ma'moon. This is really the nail in the coffin that tells Ma'moon that Khilafat and Imamat is mansus min Allah. It comes from Allah and it is not for you to give me. He says to Ma'moon, In kanat hadhihi al-khilafatu laka, wallahu ja'alaha laka, fala yajuza laka an takhla'a. Libasan al Allahu biha. That, O oh, Ma'moon, if this Khilafat was given to you by Allah, then you are not permitted to remove the cloak and the robe that Allah has clothed you with. 
وَتَجْعَلَهُ لِغَيْرِ And to give it to anyone else. وَإِنْ كَانَتِ الْخِلَافَةُ لَيْسَ لَكَ فَلَا يَجُوزَ لَكَ أَن تَجْعَلَ لِي مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ And O Ma'amun, if this khilafat is not yours, then you have no right to give me what is not yours in the first place. What a beautiful argument. And when Ma'amun realized that it was the presence of this Imam that was stopping him from gaining popularity, and when he wanted the Imam to come to Mashhad, to, to Marv where he was, so that he could use him to win the Alawi. This Imam's Imamat was 20 years. He was an Imam for 20 years after his father al qadim salam, of which 17 years he was in Medina. The last three years he was in Mashhad, in Marv. But even those three years, his impact is so significant that Shaykh Saduk has compiled two volumes on, on, on just the hadith of this uh, uh, Imam, Akhbar al rida and he had debates with different people of different schools of thought and different backgrounds to talk of Tawheed and some very uh, deep and profound theological ideas. When Ma'amun asked this Imam to leave and be brought to, my, to, to, to him in Marv, he sent a man called Raja bin Abi Dhahak and he said to him to Raja, when you bring a rida do not bring him through the cities where there are Shias because of his popularity. Do not bring him through Kufa bring him through Basra and then cross over to Ahwaz and go through the different cities of Iran, to the different cities of Faris, so that people may not know him and may not identify him. But yet you see the strength of his personality, that even when he's brought through this route, people from villages who heard the grandson of the Prophet is coming, the grandson of the Prophet is coming, they would run out to go and meet him. By the time he got to Nisabur or Nishapur as it is called, 20,000 to 24,000 scholars, scribes, got there just to listen to his words where he uttered the hadith of Zahabiyyah and he said to them that I heard from my father who heard from his father all the way to Allah through the golden chain that whoever says La ilaha illallah, Allah says whoever says La ilaha illallah enters my fort and whoever enters my fort, Amina min adabi is saved from my punishment. And then the Imam moves forward and again establishes the principle of Imama that, oh Muslims, you will not succeed without accepting us as your Imams. He again stops and addresses these 24,000 people and says, Bishurutiha with its conditions only. Wa ana min shurutiha. And I am one of those conditions. You must accept me along with your saying, La ilaha illallah, before you are saved from the punishment of the hell of hellfire. And then the Imam comes to Marv. And he stays for a period with Ma'amun. Day by day Ma'amun sees that this Imam has a strength and a personality that cannot be calmed, that cannot be reduced. I have talked to you in the past of the incident of Eid. When the Imam went out for Eid, when he would say Allahu Akbar, the city of Marv would shake, the walls would shake and say Allahu Akbar. Shaykh Mufid has narrated this in detail in his Kitab al-Irshad. When Ma'amun finally saw that he had to now dispose of this Imam, he called the Imam to his court one day and he prepared some poison grapes for this Imam. The Imam said to his companion Abu Salt al Harawi, O oh, Abu Salt, I am going to Ma'amun, but there is no good in this meeting. O oh, Abu Salt, when I return, if you see my head covered with my Aba, do not talk to me. If you see my head uncovered, then talk to me. Abu Salt stayed worried, waiting for the Imam. The Imam goes and meets Ma'amun. Ma'amun sits and holds some grapes in his hands that were not poisoned. He pretends to eat them to show the Imams that these are not poisoned. He says to the Imam, how beautiful and sweet these grapes are. The Imam tries to deflect that and says, perhaps the grapes in paradise are better. Ma'amun says, no, Ya ibn Rasulullah, you must eat of these grapes. Ma'amun, Imam says, I do not feel like eating them today. Ma'amun says, no, you must eat it. If you don't, I will think you suspect me of something. He forces the Imam to take some of this. When the Imam takes this, he stands up from his place, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. He starts leaving and going back to his home. Ma'amun says to him, where are you going, Abna Rasulillah? Imam says to him, I'm going where you are sending me, or Ma'amun. He comes back to the house, his head is now covered. Abu Salt al-Harawi says the Imam goes into a chamber and begins doing tasbih. He is worried the Imam is all alone, he is gharib. There is no one besides the Imam while he is dying. Then he sees a young boy appearing into the room and saying, I am al-Jawad from Medina. 
I would say, Ya, ya Imam al Rida, there are many similarities between you and Hussein, except for one difference. Oh Imam Rida, when you left Medina, you went to the grave of Rasulullah and cried. Time and again you went back and forth and cried and said, I am leaving the grave of Rasulullah. When Hussein left Medina, he cried the same way. Or Imam al Rida, when you left Medina, the women and the children thronged around you weeping because you are leaving. When Hussein left for the last time in Karbala, the women and the children gathered around Hussein and cried. But there was one difference from you between you and Hussein, oh Imam al Rida. The difference is that when Imam Rida left Medina for Marv, he called his family together. He said, I will never have anyone besides me when I am dying. I will not in la arju ila iyali abadan. I will never return to Medina again. My dear friends and my family, recite a majlis for me while I am alive before I die. History records that Rida said, the people sat around him and cried for Imam Rida while he was alive. Imam Rida is that gharib whose majlis was recited while he was alive. But the difference is that when Hussein was leaving and Zainab and Sakina and Rukaya were crying, Hussein was saying, do not cry for me, do not cry for me. You still have to cry in the streets and alleys of Kufa and in the prisons of Shah. ألا لعنة الله على القوم الظالمين وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أيام قلب ينقلبون ما طمع حسين. Addressing in addition to um, all of you as well, one were those uh, Muslims who are non-Shias but who hold this belief that the concept of imamat is alien or foreign to Islam. Or to Orthodox Islam and it was introduced by the Shias and uh, we talked about that yesterday extensively to prove that Imamat is believed by all Muslims even if they differ on what the qualities of an Imam must be or how an Imam gets elected. The other group that I said I was keen to address as well were those Muslims who have embraced Islam more recently who usually refer to themselves as revert Muslims, but who also say that I am neither a Shia nor a Sunni, I am just a Muslim. And it is these Muslims in particular that I wish to address today. So yesterday the main focus was on those Sunni Muslims who say Imamat is foreign to Islam. We have dealt with that. Tonight we want to address those Muslims who say it suffices to believe in the Quran and Rasul and one can be a Muslim without being of any particular leaning or inclination or following any particular school of thought. And we want to dispel that idea and see why when you become a Muslim or when you say you are a Muslim, you cannot sit on the fence on this issue. You must take a position. I would rather you say you are a Sunni Muslim than say I am neither Shia nor Sunni. And in fact, it is impossible to be something besides that because the moment it is time for Salat and you do Wudu, the way you do wudu will tell me who you are. So you can say all you like, I'm not Shia, I'm Sunni, I'm not Sunni. But how you pray will tell me who you are. But from an ideological and theological perspective as well, it is important to have an understanding of who we follow uh, in our understanding of the Quran and of course the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Muhammad. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد الصلاة والسلام على آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين الميامين المظلومين واللعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من يوم عداوتهم إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه وهو أصدق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا أطيئوا الله وأطيئوا الرسول وأولي الأمر منكم صلاة على محمد وآل محمد Tonight 
Tonight we have gathered to mark the martyrdom and passing away and shahadat of Imam Ali ibn Musa al-Rada salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad This is also a continuation from last night and is the second in a two-part series on the subject of the concept of imamat in Islam. Last night we discussed imamat from the perspective of Islamic theology or ilmul kalam and tonight we wish to discuss imamat from the perspective of history or tarikh. Obviously when we talk of tarikh and history we will bring it up to the most recent events and therefore in some sense it is a historic as well as a political analysis of the issue and concept of imama. I mentioned last night that there were two particular audiences that I was um, and they actually uh, um, have condemned Fakhruddin Razi and Al-Ghazali as later Ash'aris and the reason they condemn them is they say they held certain views that were Mu'tazali. So if you like uh, you could say Fakhruddin Razi was a later Ash'ari or an early Mu'tazali in whatever you wanna, way you want to understand it but that is not our subject it's just to clarify this because it's on record and I don't want to uh, have misled uh, anyone on this so um, I just wanted to clarify this if you can recite a salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad in continuing our discussion then when we talk about the concept of imamat in history our first discussion is from the books of seerah and history can we find examples where the Messenger of Allah himself, peace be on him and his family, expressed an opinion about his successorship. Not from the books of the Shia. From the books of the Shia it is very clear that he expressed his opinion and that he made it very clear that Ali was to be his successor. But from the perspective, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. From the perspective of the non-Shias, can we look and find examples? And indeed we can. The first example we get is from Sirah ibn Hisham, a very well-known uh, biography of the Prophet. In that it says that when the Prophet invited Banu Amir, this was a tribe that he invited towards Islam, and these was the days when he was still in Mecca, he hadn't yet been invited to Medina, they offered to embrace Islam on a condition. They said to him, we will accept your message on the condition that if you gain power ayakunu lana al-amr min ba'dik will we have any authority and any say in the matter after your passing away and ibn hisham in his sira says that even at a time when muslims were few in number and weak and you would imagine that the Prophet was looking for as much support as possible, he refused to compromise on this issue. He said to them, Al Amru Yada'ahu Haythu Yasha. This matter is in Allah's hands, He will place it wherever He pleases. And of course, he could have said at that point that this message, this matter is in the hands of the Ummah, or this matter is in the hands of the people who will have influence, the Ahlul Halli Wal Aqd that we mentioned yesterday. But he didn't mention any of this. He said, no, I cannot promise you anything like that. This is one example. The other example as well from Sirah ibn Hisham says that after Rasulullah moved to Medina and established himself there, he sent a man as an ambassador called Salit bin Amr to Yamama. Yamama was a place that was ruled by a Christian uh, um, ruler and uh, he sent this uh, Salit bin Amir there to invite them to Islam. The ruler there said to Salit, sending a message back to the Prophet, he said, what you invite me to is indeed beautiful, but I am a poet and I am an orator and the Arabs venerate and honor me. Give me some authority and I will follow you. فَاجْعَلْ لِي بَعْدَكَ الْأَمْرَ 
Give me some authority, I will follow you. And again, we are told the Prophet refused to compromise on this issue. And in fact, he said, even if he asks me for an inch of land, I will not give it to him. This is entirely in God's hands. In other words, I am not the one who's going to choose my successor. Allah will choose who should succeed me. And there is another famous history that records the history of the Prophet that's known as Tariq ibn Kathir. Tariq ibn Kathir says that this... Before we begin the subject though, just a correction from last night uh, that was brought to my attention. Um, last night when I was talking about the two main understandings in theology amongst the Sunni Muslims, the Ash'ari and the Mu'tazili, and I gave some examples of scholars from each side, I mentioned that Fakhruddin Razi was a Mu'tazili and it was brought to my attention that he was actually an Ash'ari. And uh, I just want to shed a little light on this. Um, it is true that most scholars will say that uh, Fakhruddin al-Razi was an Ash'ari scholar of uh, a Shafi'i following from a fiqh perspective. However, it is interesting to note as well that he did hold certain views that were Mu'tazili. For example, if you look at the um, Encyclopedia of Islamic Philosophy uh, that was edited by Oliver Lehman and I think Sayyid Hussein Nasr as well, there is an article in there by John Cooper on Fakhruddin Razi. And he talks about how Fakhruddin Razi had certain differing opinions from the Ash'aris on issues like free will, for example. Although that's not our discussion. And the, uh, the, the Wahhabi understanding, uh, they call themselves Salafi. When I say Wahhabi, I don't mean uh, as, as uh, in, in a derogatory manner, but because if I say Salafi, most of you don't understand who I'm referring to. As followers of uh, Muhammad ibn al-Wahhab uh, or Abdul Wahhab, um, they have actually set up a website called asharis.com. And on their website, they try to prove this idea that there are true Ash'aris and false Ash'aris. And they divide them as early Ash'aris and later Ash'aris. And they say that individuals like Ash'ari himself, the founder, and Al-Baqilani, whom I mentioned yesterday a number of times, they are true Ash'aris and what they call early Ash'aris. 